Thank you. Thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. One more time. Good afternoon. Let's wake you all up. Good afternoon. All right. Uh, pop quiz first. How many in the room are programmers? How many are managers? All right. How many are venture capitalists? <laughs> and how many are Republicans? Good. Sorry. Got to know your audience. Got to know your audience. So Casey asked me to, she said she had this slot after lunch, you know, people come in, they're kind of eaten, they kind of fall asleep. Could you be the guy that shows up and wakes them all up and talk? So what, she said, what am I going to talk about? So we'll talk about future of software development. And I'm like, Casey, you must be kidding me. I'm the past of the future of software development. I started programming in 1978, maybe. So it's been 40, 45 years old that I'm programming. So I'm the past. What will I talk about future? And she said to me, you know, we have a president who makes things up all day long. <laughs> so, I mean, how hard can that be? Maybe you can do the same. So, <laughs> so it got me thinking, and I uh, looked at the dictionary. I found this word. It's called ultra crepidarian. How many of you have heard this word, ultra crepidarian? Ultra crepidarian is a person who gives opinions about, the, about things they know nothing about. So who is the biggest ultra crepidarian in the country today? And if you are a founder, CEO, who is the ultra crepidarian in your life? There you go. And if you are a programmer, who is the ultra crepidarian in your life? Sorry? Coming there? Your manager. Sorry, managers. I've been there. I've been there. I've been called names. And then, if you are a really hardcore programmer, really hardcore programmer, you know you're still cold. Who is the ultra crepidarian? The user, what do they know? <laughs> That's how we think. And that reminds me of a little story. There's this guy you know, who's uh, walking down on a hike, walking up on a hike. He finds this little lamp, you know, the upset, as all stories go. Genie pops up and says, hey, I'm the genie. I can make anything happen. Ask, make a wish. Now, this guy is a pacifist. So he brings out a map, puts his finger in the Middle East, and say, make it peaceful. The genie goes, man, you know, that, that's just not going to happen. These guys have been fighting for 3,000 years. There are three gods involved. This is above my pay grade. I can't do this. Ask something else. So, so the guy said, well, I'm a programmer. I'm a programmer, and can you make it so that every user change requests make sense? And the genie goes, show me the map. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, to talk about the future, a lot of time is good to look at the past. History normally is a good indicator of where things will go. So I'll just take a quick few minutes talking about the past. So when I started programming way back then, life was very simple for a programmer. You had one kind of a computer called mainframe, mostly IBM. You had one language called Fortran. You had one editor. You started writing your code. You punched it into punch cards. How many have seen punch cards, by the way? Not bad, I'm impressed, <laughs> not bad. You, you got your punch cards. 
it took your punch cards to the basement, some operator loaded it, and you got a program in front of you, and hopefully you debugged it. You know what the most difficult thing was? Carrying those punch cards from your office to the basement to load it, because God forbid if you dropped them, <laughs> they were numbered. You could never put them back. And at the same time, though, you were hoping that if you're going to drop them, dear God, dear Lord, let me drop them by bumming into the domain programmer that I've been looking at for a long time. Because once both of you drop the cards, you'll all be, you'd both be sorry. You'll end up in a bar. Anything can happen from that. <laughs> That's life used to be. It was fun. It was easy. And we were building this large, large, large monolithic program. So we used to pride ourselves in saying, hey, how many lines of codes have you written? And we say, $100,000. My program, million lines of code. Size matters. <laughs> Somebody else will come along. My program and four million lines of code. In fact, there was a time when we were measured on lines of code written every day. That was how productivity of a programmer was measured. And then this distributed computing came along. Messed everything up. I said, well, these large programs are so difficult to manage, maintain, evolve, get performance out of it. How about we break it apart into small, smaller programs that can talk to each other? Great idea. Great idea but created so much complexity. Started with what was known as inter-process communication. You had to figure out how to talk to other programs, and that's where the first API was written. How many of you know when was the first API written? Sorry? Somebody else? The first API was written in 1962, the year I was born. <laughs> Truly, actually, it was written in 1962 by a bunch of people in IBM as they started to break down the code into pieces and say, we got to define this thing as to how these programs will talk to each other, and let's call it an API. The first incarnation of an API was a library. You had a definite, definite set of things you included in your code, and hopefully it worked the way it worked. But once you distributed the systems, the library no longer worked. And that started the evolution that we are now beginning to almost see is how API started. The next version of that, what was known after IPC, is what's known as CORBA. Anybody remember CORBA? Yeah. Hard as hell, and there was a language called IDL, Interface Definition Language, precursor to API. And then time moved on. We got something called SOA. How many of you heard about SOA? And then time moved on, and we got REST APIs. Every iteration of software development that has been happening is been happening for one reason, is take a piece of code, make it work wherever, whatever environment, whatever uh, operating system, whatever database, whatever cloud, mobile, no mobile, doesn't matter. You write a piece of code, you describe it, interface, API, and you put it out there, and it runs. It should run. It doesn't, really. It still doesn't. But companies like Postman, as you saw today, we are now in the place where defining APIs and using APIs is getting easier. And what does that mean for the future? So I want to leave you with an imagery. How many cells do humans have in their body? Any guesses? 
Average human has 30 to 30, 40 million, 40 trillion cells in the body. And then the average number is 32.5 trillion cells in a human body. Each of these cells has interfaces. Each cell has an interface through which whatever we do, we eat, we consume, it converts into something called a peptide. A peptide goes, connects to a proper interface on the cell membrane, and if the interface is right, the cell membrane will open, and the peptide will go inside, and it'll do its thing. It'll, it'll perform a function. It actually performs a function. Each peptide, so in our body, there are millions of peptides circulating at any given time. Some are produced by the brain, some are produced by the intestine, and they're all working with this 30-some trillion cells seamlessly. All of your cells, as you sit here right now, there are probably, I don't know, trillions of APIs happening inside us where these peptides are going, knocking the doors of the cells uh, with the properly defined interface. The cell accepts the interface, goes inside it, executes the function, and produces a result. That's what a human body is. So my view of the future is very simple. I'm looking forward to a day when 32.5 trillion pieces of software would work together seamlessly. Just work. And that will be the future. And then we would have truly created technology, software, that can do what humans can do. Thank you. Any questions at all, or shall I pass it down? One or two questions? OK. Any questions, please? I guess you guys are hating me for calling Trump out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, um, you used the word seamless. Yeah. Uh, I'm a writer. Yes. I've been fighting against that with APIs from day one. Um, is there a such thing as a seamless API? Okay, so the question was, is there any such thing as a seamless API? Well, the way, I don't know the answer, but the way I think of it is that you have two things, or multiple things, and they need to work together, fit in together, and if they don't fit in together, there's friction. And in fact, $82 billion of software industry goes in fixing bugs, fixing this friction point, because the interfaces don't work. $82 billion every year, kid you not. And so the notion is that, the, in, at least in my mind, the notion is that these interfaces, as they're developed and designed, are putting, pulling these things together, and as far as these two entities are concerned, it feels like a seamless flow, because you're going through that interface that's accepted by both parties. So that's how I look at it as maybe seamless. One more question, if any. Somebody ask one question. Anybody? Programmer, manager, VC, <laughs> anybody? Please. Right. So human beings are, I'm talking defining a body as this, how it works. And there are 32 trillion pieces at work, and they're working beautifully together because the interfaces are working. Any interface that stops working, that cell starts to die. And that's pretty much what happens in the real world. But to your point, we are not interfaces of software. We are contained. And the notion is that, but we do interface. I mean, here I am interfacing with you, right? I'm talking to you, I'm sharing with you. And, and I think the, the, the notion is that the state of technology, as it exists today, software technology, we're talking about AI, we're barely scratching the surface of where we can get. I don't know how many of you have noticed, now we have technology where you can implant chips and circuits in brains 
And if you don't have an arm, it's amputated just by the thought, which sends the signal, interfaces to the bionic arm, you can lift things. It's not your arm. That's a beautiful thing. And it all works, it all works because the interfaces are defined and operate in the manner they're supposed to, as promised, and life change. So that's sort of the thought, the vision. Well, thank you so much for hearing me out. <laughs>